Now, today we want to take this concept just a little further and uh, talk about a very serious subject. We want to talk about the prevention and treatment of homosexuality in boys. What a very, very important topic. And uh, one that parents are very nervous about, very anxious about it, because they fear that their sons and daughters will become gay or lesbian. And why wouldn't they fear it? Because suddenly those images are everywhere. And very carefully programmed images are presented throughout the culture and uh, done for a purpose. If you uh, watch the sitcoms, uh, you will find that there is an obligatory homosexual character in every one of those programs. And they're presented in a very sympathetic role. They're always in a very respectful role. Uh, whereas you will not find anywhere in sitcoms today the image of a disciplined, caring, responsible, loving father. They don't exist, and certainly not one who's committed to his wife and children. You know, it's not there. What are boys to think? What are their conclusions to be drawn? There are no role models. There are absolutely no role models. And then you take the fact that many boys don't have fathers, and they've never seen how a man is supposed to act. And so they're sitting ducks for this propaganda that's out there and it's all around it's not only sitcoms it's in the movies you know out of Hollywood the most beautiful people imaginable are known to be gay and it's become not only an acceptable thing for kids to think about but it's almost attractive to them and it has a great influence uh, on them and uh, now of course it's in the schools um, folks, I do have to tell you there's some things that bother me a lot, and I'm about to mention one at the very top of the list. Anybody here from California? Quite a few. Uh, you do realize, of course, that the state legislature in California has mandated that homosexuality, in a very positive way, the same thing I was just talking about, uh, is presented through the curriculum K-12. Do you understand that? That is the most offensive and egregious thing I can think of. Can you imagine 20, 25, five-year-olds sitting in a circle on the floor with their little hands folded in their laps while their teacher talks to them about adult perverse sexuality? Have we gone completely mad? You know what a stem cell is? A stem cell is a cell, in this case a human cell, that's not differentiated. It can go any direction depending on what environment it's in. Uh, if it is uh, uh, ultimately um, located in the brain, it becomes uh, neural tissue. If it's located uh, someplace else, it becomes bone or it becomes saliva or it becomes an eye. A stem cell has the ability to be whatever it uh, is surrounded by in its environment. You get the connection here? Children are the stem cells of culture. If you can capture and hold the minds of young children and then provide the right um, environment for them, you can grow them into almost anything you want. So I saw a video the other day of children in Afghanistan. They're teaching those little children to be hateful and to kill when they're six, seven, eight years of age. Well, they grow up to have terrorist attitudes because they, they are stem cells. They can be, they're malleable. You can do with them what you want. That's why there is such a struggle for the control of the hearts and minds of kids today because those who want to change the culture know that it's fairly simple to do. You simply get control of what you teach children, what they are led to believe, the rationale that they're given, the ridicule for those who don't fit in and don't see it that way. And that's what's occurring, not only in California now, but in other places. The National Education Association came to California um, for their annual convention. 
And one of their proposals, very quietly, was to recommend to all school districts across the country that homosexuality not only be taught uh, kindergarten through grade 12, but in every class, every subject, so that you take the subject of math, and you take the subject of language arts, and you take all these things and, and run with it, and, and everything eventually goes to homosexuality. What they're doing is training the stem cells. And we're going to have the consequence of that if parents don't understand what's happening. In fact, folks, I don't understand. You, you all are Californians. I don't want to insult anybody, but I don't understand why you hold still for that. I, I mean, those are your kids. That don't belong to the state or the state legislature. They're your kids. And uh, you should be able to speak out against it. And you should be able to go to the polls and make sure that some other people with different values uh, are representing your interest uh, with regard to uh, children. The focus here is on children. That's what we're talking about. Our subject today is not homosexuality in the adult world. My concern is with homosexuality and children and what we need to do to protect them and what the symptoms are when we see something going wrong. To the contrary, again, there are highly sophisticated materials that are out there uh, to train teachers in how to open them to homosexuality. Now I'm going to show you a video explaining to teachers how to teach children about this subject. I teach creative movement to the first and second grade and I was an after school teacher. And this is a soccer ball. <laughs> How many of you have ever kicked a soccer ball or played the game of soccer? Come on over on that bench. I bet you guys are fly right. There you go. You guys are included too. Imagine if every time I went to play soccer, I had to hide my right shin. I might hide it like this. And then I try to play soccer. It wouldn't be easy, but I could do it. It would, you know, it would take a lot of energy to play soccer and also hide my leg. Well, at CFS, I don't have to hide. So I can play soccer with two legs. Can you see how much better I can play? Yep. At CFS, I can tell the truth that I'm a gay man. And that gives me so much more energy to be a better teacher, to be a better co-worker, and to be a better friend. I'll see you on the soccer pitch. Okay, you hear the passion? Okay, you, you see where they're trying to take those kids? Uh, when the man with the soccer ball leaned over and put something on his leg, did you see him do that? That was the uh, pink triangle, the, the symbol of homosexuality. And uh, I don't have time to show you other aspects of it, but there was an interchange with the kids where they asked them, what is a family? What does this mean? and begin to move them from the traditional family uh, to other images. Now, here is a Xerox of a book that's now being used in California called Jesse's Dream Skirt. Okay, uh, let me just read you a little bit of it. There are and were and always will be boys who wear dresses and skirts and things that whirl, twirl, flow, and glow. One boy named Jesse liked wrapping himself in sheets to make free-flowing dresses. And he goes on to describe how this is his, his uh, great desire, is to dress like a girl. And then we come on over and uh, we talk about the fact that these uh, boys are made fun of when they do this. And, and uh, in, in fact, even their parents uh, don't like it. 
And it says here, yeah, said John, boys can't wear skirts. Why not, Sarah said, starting to get mad, because that's what my daddy told me. Then Mike spoke up. One day my sister and me try on her old dresses and hats. It was a lot of fun, but then my father came in. When he saw us, he got really mad and yelled at me. Take off that dress. I don't want my son to be a sissy. So I took off the dress, but I don't know. I still don't see what's wrong with it. After the story, Bruce took a, a piece of cloth from a box and wrapped it like a loose skirt around his waist, and then it goes on from there. Uh, you can see the manipulative aspect of this. Now, part of this agenda, because that's what it is, has been to teach us that homosexuality is genetic. And uh, the media has worked really hard to convince us of that, and it started about 1990. Uh, here are uh, magazines from that era. Here's Newsweek, the future of gay America. And then it gets more specific. This is 1992, February 24th. Is this child gay, born or bred? The origins of homosexuality. So they're starting to hack away at the belief that homosexuality uh, is environmental in nature and in its origin. And then we go on from there. Here is July 26, 1993. This is uh, Time Magazine, July 26. Born gay, studies of family trees and DNA make the case that male homosexuality is in the genes. Okay, that's 93. Here is uh, also June 1st, 93, the advocate, uh, gray matter and gay matter, and uh, Simon LeVay, who has... Uh, done some of the early research that's been quoted by everybody. Even Simon LeVay says that <coughs> what he originally said is wrong. Nevertheless, they continue to quote him. Simon LeVay continues to push his hypothalamic agenda. In other words, that the uh, gay uh, characteristics are rooted in the brain and in the uh, genes. Uh, here's uh, the Atlantic. Homosexuality and Biology. This is March 93. How come all of a sudden everybody's talking about the same thing? 1990, 1993. Well, it goes on from there. Here is Newsweek, 1998. Gay for life, going straight. The uproar over sexual conversion. And uh, in a minute you will meet this man right here, John Polk, who's on our staff. Uh, he took an awful lot of heat, he and Ann. Uh, for allowing uh, themselves to be uh, known uh, for the fact that they had, both of them had been uh, gay and lesbian, and yet uh, they came out and are married now. You're going to hear that story. Uh, they've gotten death threats and everything else. And here is the advocate, and it says, why are we gay? Now, everyone knows now that homosexuality is not genetic. Even the advocates know it. Everybody knows it because they've looked diligently and they can't find any evidence of that. And the reason they can't is because there is no evidence of it. And yet in 1977, 25% of the American people thought homosexuality was genetic and 75% thought it was environmental. Now, just over 50% think it is genetic. They've done their work. It doesn't matter. Even to themselves and to the press and everybody else, they now are willing to admit there is no evidence of homosexuality being genetic. But it doesn't matter because the damage has been done. The American people have been told this, and uh, they have uh, believed it. And that is influencing policy. Now, why was there such an effort to say that black is white and green is brown and that everything that looks one way is actually another? Why did they work so hard on that? Why was the media doing this? It's to link it to the civil rights movement, see, and to uh, link it to uh, race, for example, which opens the door to all of the affirmative action things and the whole attitude toward homosexuality was linked to this issue. 
Nevertheless, it is baloney. It's just baloney. Think about it for a minute. Just think about it. Uh, if homosexuality were genetic over a period of 5,000 years, what would have happened to those genes? They would have gradually been eliminated in the gene pool because they don't reproduce as often. You see? Uh, so even if it were genetic, there would be fewer now than there were a thousand years ago. Twin studies. If you have identical twins, you have by definition the same genetic structure in both twins. Then it must stand to reason if homosexuality is biological in nature, if it is genetic, then if one has it, the other one has to have it. But it is not that way. Only about 50%. R, which is explained through environmental factors. Uh, and also, if it were biological, uh, you would not have epidemics that occur. See, you would have a constancy of homosexuality across time and cultures. And yet, as we know, there are times when homosexuality flourishes, such as in Sodom and Gomorrah's time or ancient Greece, or as the Apostle Paul uh, wrote about in Romans 1, a time in Rome when men and women burned with lust for each other. See, there are times when it flourishes, and you wouldn't have that if it were genetic. And finally, if it were genetic, then it would be immutable, unchanging. You would not be able to treat it. No one could ever come out of homosexuality, and it would be sealed from birth, which is what they try to tell us. The truth of the matter is there are tens of thousands of people who have come out of homosexuality, and they're all over. There, there are more than a thousand who are being treated at any given time for homosexuality. They don't all change. It's not easy to change. I don't want to imply that it's just a simple thing, you just decide you're not going to be homosexual anymore. No, there are deeply rooted factors that account for this, and they are tough to whip. They're really tough, and it's a whole lot better to do it early. And that's uh, what we're here to talk about. Now, I said there are tens of thousands who have come out, and I want you to meet two of them. And I'm very honored to have them here. Uh, first, I want you to hear from John Polk, who is our uh, manager of homosexuality and gender department. Uh, he is making an incredible contribution to this ministry, and I have great love and appreciation for him because he pays the price every day for what he does. He's got the courage to do it, and I want to tell you, there are very, very few who have come out of homosexuality who are willing to talk about it because they just get massacred in the media. I mean, you saw the Newsweek, you saw what they do, but John Polk has been willing to take the heat. The other is J. Michael Haley, who is the youth and gender analyst. He is also on our staff and is doing a wonderful job. Both these guys, um, are, uh, they, they're heroes to me. And uh, I want you to hear just very briefly from each of them as they tell you uh, their story. John, right here. <laughs> Come on, John. Would you all welcome John Paul? Well, thank you. It's a real honor to be here and speak to you today. And I wish that we were talking about a more pleasant subject. One of the things that our staff does here at Focus is minister to parents who have children suffering with homosexuality in Christian families. Uh, just as a matter of fact, just this morning as I arrived at work, I found out that a woman who came to assist us on our staff because she was very concerned about her first cousin's lesbianism. She came to learn about homosexuality so she could take the message of hope to her cousin. We found out just today that her cousin took her life yesterday at the age of 23. This is very serious, uh, especially when you grow up in a Christian family, the conflict that arises within you. 
And so it is something that we do need to talk about. I'm so glad that the Ministry of Focus on the Family is actually one of the very few Christian organizations that have the courage to deal with this. Many of us just want to bury our heads in the sand and not deal with it. But what I want to do in the next few minutes is just tell you a little bit about my story. Because what really motivates me today to keep talking about this after 15 years is children. We see that children are, are being attacked, children are being assaulted, and childhood is being stripped away from especially young boys. When homosexuality is being taught to five-year-olds, as a matter of fact, my own son, who's four and a half years old, asked me one day, Daddy, can boys get married? How many of us, when we were kids at four and a half, would even think of such a concept? We don't even know what marriage is hardly at the age of four and a half. The children are being indoctrinated. You know, my story is very similar to many men who wrestle with homosexuality. I had a tremendous sense of insecurity when I was growing up. My parents got married very young. They got married because my mother was pregnant, and in 1963, that's what you did. You got married if you were going to have a baby. So their marriage did not have a very solid foundation. And by the time I was five years old, my parents had divorced. The combination of my parents' marriage really set me up for a lot of emotional problems. My mother came from a very domineering home where she had a lot of emotional needs, and my father came from a family where the most important thing was to make money, to earn a living, to get straight A's, to go to college, very performance oriented. And my paternal grandfather was not nurturing of my father whatsoever. And of course, through the environment, through upbringing, that's the way my father was with me. He was very cold, he was very distant, and very quickly my father saw characteristics in me of sensitivity, of creativity, I was artistic, I was very intuitive, I was easily hurt, and that was very different from who my father was. It's interesting, you know, I think men are pretty narcissistic. We want our sons to be just like us, don't we? You know, our egos are this big. I even find this in my own parenting. I have two boys, and I'm just thrilled when I see my sons mimic me or want to do something that is like me. There's just something about men that we want our children to be like us. And when they're not, oftentimes we detach from them. And that is what my father did for me. He did not understand me. He did not know how to relate to me. So he pulled away. And the older I got, the more he pulled away. And the only other parent I had to hang on to was my mother. It's interesting. Uh, a lot of us have a concept of homosexual men as being very effeminate. But I don't know if we understand where that effeminacy comes from. Well, it's the result of imprinting. It is not genetic. Uh, traits, mannerisms, characteristics are imprinted on us through learning. You can even see a mother and a daughter that are grown up, they may make the same facial expressions, the same hand gestures. You're not born doing that, you learn that through imprinting. So when I was growing up, I didn't feel safe and secure with my father. My mother was very emotionally insecure, so I bonded to her like glue. As I grew older, I even was confused where she left off and I began. It was almost as though there was a golden lasso tied around us and we were almost one person. I felt safe with her. I became her confidant and her caretaker. And I started picking up her gestures, her mannerisms, her speech patterns. Well, there may be nothing wrong with that, but when you get into school and you start going through elementary school, other children pick up on those tendencies and what happens is I became completely alienated. I felt almost as though I was looking through a window onto a playground where the boys were and I knew I was a boy but I was so different and I did not belong and I didn't know why. You know a lot of homosexual people will tell you well I've been gay all my life. Well we know through science, through psychology that's not true. Children are not sexual beings before puberty unless sexuality is introduced to them through some fashion. But we are gender-based, and we bond to those that we are the most alike. That's part of what creates our gender identity, which develops into sexuality once we go through puberty and, and, and get older. 
that that wasn't happening for me. I was afraid of boys. I was not rough and tumble. I felt very insecure. And on and on this continued until the senior years of high school, that profound feeling of difference, of alienation, was very confusing. I didn't know what was going on. I had a dream in the back of my mind of growing up, getting married, having a family, just like everybody else. But also by the time I was a senior in high school, my mother and father both had been divorced and married three times to other people. So I had a tremendous insecurity that men would always walk out. So on my 18th birthday, a group of friends took me to a gay bar and I was seduced into homosexuality. And I say seduced into it because it was very fearful for me. But as I look back, I felt there were no other options. You know, often we say that homosexuality is a choice. And I think that's partially right, but partially wrong. As people are developing, they do not choose their feelings. As a matter of fact, many try to reject these feelings, especially if they grow up with Christian values. They try to reject them, they know they're wrong, they put them off. Now that wasn't my case, but who wants to feel different from everybody else? At the same time, you know there is something innately wrong about this kind of behavior. And so we know there is a conflict. But I felt I had no choice. I was ushered into homosexuality. And as time went by and years ensued, I became very addicted to this way of life. I just spiraled down into behaviors that would never even be appropriate for me to mention to you. I became a male prostitute for a period of time. I was a very promiscuous homosexual man because this is the way gay life was. This was not unusual. I, I was actually um, more chaste than most of my friends in homosexuality. By the time I was 24, I felt very desperate. I was so lonely. I was, I was alienated. Uh, my family didn't understand what was going on. I would come home from these bars. I would basically cry myself to sleep. And the cry of my heart was, isn't there some man who won't walk out on me? All these 24 years of feeling rejected by men, of feeling lonely, of feeling alienated, I had a tremendous fear of straight men, always feeling less than. And so when we look at homosexuals, we have to have compassion. You know, I think we, we get repelled by the expression of their behavior when we see it on TV. But underneath that manifestation is a profound sense of hurt, of loneliness, of alienation, of feeling different, of feeling isolated. Really, homosexuality is very easily explained. And it has so much to do with the gender identity development that is arrested, that doesn't take place. I tried to take my life when I was 24, not because I wanted to die, but I wanted to be rescued. I wanted someone to reach into my life and change it and make it better. And it was at this time when a couple uh, be befriended me as I was going to college, and we developed a long-term relationship, and one thing led to another, and Christ was introduced to me. I moved from my home in Ohio all the way to California, this was in 1987, to find help to come out of this. And as the years went by and I began the very difficult struggle out of homosexuality with all these feelings, clearly understanding at this point that I was not born or made this way, that sometimes I would be so tempted to go back to homosexuality, the only thing that would keep me from it was that I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that the Bible was true. I just knew it was true. No matter what my feelings told me, my feelings were wrong and they lied to me. But God would never lie. And I knew if I just hung on and worked through this pain, that things would change. Well, they did. And that's the good news. Slowly, things were changing. I was becoming a whole man. I was befriended by many of the men in our church. I was feeling as a whole person. And finally, when I would look at women, I didn't feel like I was one of them, but I felt different from them. It was this wall that was between us that I wanted to break through. And, uh, you know, I have the unique opportunity of going through puberty at the age of 29. <laughs> 
And it was very strange doing it the second time, I assure you. Remember those feelings the first time you kissed the opposite sex or, or held hands on your first date? That feeling of electricity that went through you? That's what I felt as a 29-year-old man. And you know, I had so many experiences in homosexuality and, and sexual ones and emotional ones. But when I met the woman who I fell in love with, who would become my wife, just holding her hand felt like nothing I had ever experienced in homosexuality. And it felt right, and for the first time in my life, I felt normal. And that was a wonderful feeling. You know, people around us in our church, because my wife had also come out of lesbianism, they, they delighted in seeing us walk through this process. And our pastor thought, you two are going to need a little help. And he started counseling us from our very first date. And that man counseled us every week until we married. He stood by us and walked along with us. And so now, uh, I've been married 10 years and have two sons, and life just gets better. It's not free of struggle. None of us are promised a life free of struggle. I have to realize that there are certain triggers to homosexual temptation. I would say probably 90% of the time I don't experience these temptations. But if I'm under stress, if I'm traveling too much, if I'm feeling insecure about my masculinity, if I don't feel close to my male friends, that old enemy comes back and sits on my shoulder. And I need to walk in maintenance. You know, I always have to laugh when gay activists say, you haven't changed. If you ever have a homosexual thought or feeling, you're still gay. And my answer is, you can say whatever you want. You haven't walked in my shoes. But what I can tell you is, for 24 years of my life, even the thought of heterosexual interaction was really nauseating to me. And now I've had a successful marriage for 10 years, have a very fulfilling emotional and sexual relationship with my wife, have fathered two sons, so something has changed. And they always shut up. And I say, you can't explain transformation in a test tube. It's only explained by the evidence of a changed life. Thank you. I, too, would love to be talking to you today about the wonders. And I know that as individuals like John Polk and myself and the many others that we know that are out there begin to share the story of the power of Christ in our lives and how he's brought us out of very negative situations and made our lives something purposeful, it gives people hope, it gives parents hope, and it gives those that struggle with homosexuality hope. I was born in Southern California, and I, unlike John, was raised in a very Christian home. Another thing that's very important to understand about my upbringing is that I have two older sisters that are 10 and 12 years older than myself. So you can imagine what my father that owns sporting goods stores in the Southern California area had in store for his only son. I was going to be the best football player, the best baseball player, the best basketball player, the best soccer player. I was going to be the best everything that my father could possibly make me. One of the problems was is that I didn't have many of those same interests that my father desired for me. I remember specifically at the age of nine being on a hunting trip with my father. This should have been a time where I was accepted and ushered into the realm of masculinity. I remember being on that trip. Specifically, I hit a bird down in the middle of the field. We were surrounded by 15 or 20 other men. I went over to pick that bird up and knowing that it needed to go in my bag behind me, it was still alive that I had to kill it. So I attempted to step on its head, and from across the field, my father would yell things like, just pick it up and wring its neck, you sissy. And so those were times of what masculinity were represented for me. I had no desire to be like my father. I had no desire to hang out with other men. I was verbally ridiculed. My father would call me Michelle or refer to me as his third daughter, thinking that ultimately that would make me tough, that that would push me into the realm of masculinity. Instead, what it did, it caused me to fear masculinity, and I became what most of you would know as a mommy's boy. I retreated back to the safety of hanging out with my mother and my two sisters, and that was what was comfortable for me. At the age of 11, there was a man that began to pay a lot of attention to me. It was wonderful. Since I grew up in Southern California, he took me to Disneyland, he took me to the latest movies, he taught me how to surf. It was an incredible relationship. He reaffirmed who I was. But the problem was, at the age of 11, that attention turned sexual. 
So from the age of 11 to the age of 18, I was a victim of sexual abuse. And I can say that to you today because I know that no 26, 27, 28 year old man should have been doing what he was doing with me at the age of 11 and 12 and 13, but it didn't feel like abuse. Proverbs 27, seven says, the man that's full loathes honey, but to him who's starving, even what's bitter tastes sweet. And I was so starving for male affirmation and attention that when this man offered me the bitterness that the world had, it met a deep need in my life. So very early, I continued to grow up. I was in junior high and high school now, it, involved with this man in this relationship. I had a father telling me that I was less masculine than everyone else. I began to hear the words that we hear on campus today, fag, queer, and sissy. I came to understand what those words meant, and that label went right on. And I lived from a very early age as an identified gay individual. From the age of 16, I remember calling myself gay and referring to myself in my own mind as a gay man. I invested in the homosexual community from that age because I realized this is where I found my security. This is where I found my identity. So growing up in Southern California, I, it was very easy for me to invest in the homosexual community. I lived in that community for 12 years. Also, going to church. But the problem was is the church that I was attending did not speak about how men and women walked out of homosexuality. I would hear the testimonies of drug addicts. I would hear the testimonies of alcoholics. I would hear the testimonies of adulterers. But never did I hear the testimony of a man or woman that had walked away from homosexuality through the power of Jesus Christ. My church didn't talk much about the issue. So what happened in my mind when I was sitting in the pews is, well, this church doesn't care about my issue. God doesn't care about this issue, so why should I stay involved? I instead found the homosexual community was completely embracing, and when I walked into those gay bars and was around those gay individuals, I felt like I had purpose, that I finally had hope, and that I finally had a group of people that understood what I was feeling and who I was. So as I said, I completely invested in the homosexual community for 12 years. And homosexual men, as all men, whether you're heterosexual or homosexual, are focused visually. So I wanted to become the most valued commodity that I could possibly become to that community. I was working out two to three hours a day. I was doing injectable steroids. I was bulimic because I wanted to eat, but I didn't want to gain weight. I wanted to have that perfect men's health body because if I had that, then I was a valued commodity to the male homosexual community. So after living there for 12 years, buying into the argument that I was born homosexual, that there were 10% of us in society, and that I needed to fight for my rights and fight against what the church and, and other people were saying about who we were, I began to march in gay pride parades and began to fight for the rights of my people. I did all of that living there, was on this treadmill of life, of the working out and the steroids and the throwing up, all the while longing to be married longing to have children, but flushing those dreams far away from my life because I didn't think they were ever possible for who I was. It wasn't until I was 28 years old, I had gone back home to visit my family. I wanted to stay connected to my family. My sisters were going on. They had married godly Christian men. They were having children. I remember holding my nieces and my nephews and longing for that in my own life but knowing that I couldn't attain that because I was born gay, I had so believed that issue. I remember going home one Thanksgiving to visit my family. I found myself in a gay gym and I was headed towards an illicit situation with another man. We got out to his car and he said, I'm sorry that I've led you on, but I'm a Christian and I'm trying to walk away from homosexuality. That was the very first time that I ever heard such a thing in my entire life. He said, well, will you at least talk to me about this? Because I began to be venomous with this man. I said, what are you talking about that you can walk away from homosexuality? Don't you know that you were born gay? And if your God can change you, then why are you here? And why are you struggling with this? And why are you dealing with this? This doesn't sound like a God that I would want to serve. He said, well, will you please get in my car and talk to me about this? So 11.45 at night, we were driving around, and this man began to tell me about another godly man that had pursued him with the love of Christ and was sharing with him about how his relationship with his father may have played into this. This man was also sexually abused and how that might have played in to his component of feeling as though he was a homosexual individual. And these things started to ring true and he began to talk to me about this man named Jeff. Midnight was coming at this point. We pulled into a parking lot. 
We were sitting there talking, and my heart started to be drawn to what this man said, but yet I couldn't trust it because I knew to trust it meant that I had to trust that God that I felt had let me down. And then I had to come back to the Christian community that I felt didn't understand me and actually hated me for who I was. So he began to tell me about this godly man that was helping him to understand the root causes of male homosexuality. Jeff this and Jeff that and Jeff is challenging with me with this and all of a sudden his eyes got really big and he goes, oh my goodness, there's Jeff right now. And I knew at that point that there was something happening in the realm of whatever. And he invited Jeff over and that started a five-year godly mentoring relationship with this man named Jeff Conrad that haunted me when I didn't want it with the love of Christ. I would move from city to city. I wouldn't give this man my 418 address. He would track me down. <laughs> he would send me birthday cards that would say, I don't even know if you're getting this birthday card, but I want to let you know that I love you, that God loves you, and that change is possible. So finally, after living on that treadmill, looking at myself in the mirror one day, I thought, you know, I only have myself to blame because I wasn't finding what I was being promised by the gay community. I was promised that I could have a relationship that would last. After going through relationship, after relationship, after relationship, never finding what I wanted, selling myself, being arrested for prostitution, I thought, you know, I only have myself to blame because there's this man saying that there's something different for me. So, as it says of the prodigal son, when I came to the end of myself, I picked up the phone and I called Jeff Conrad and I said, Jeff, if you can be this faithful to me, surely the Jesus and the God that you know can be that much more faithful. I want to come home and I want to give this a try. So December of 1989, I left homosexuality. And I'd love to say that from that point, it's been an easy, incredible, God-serving story. But the reality is that's just not the truth. The year of 90 was hell on earth for me. I had known homosexuality since the age of 11. By that time, I was 28 years old. It was all I had known. I didn't know how to live a life that was chaste. I didn't know what to do. I would go to counseling with a Christian counselor. He would challenge me. I would feel vulnerable. I would feel opened up. And on the way home from counseling, the only way that I knew to comfort myself was to put myself in the arms of another man. And that's exactly what happened for me. I finally came about to find a group of individuals, a ministry known as Exodus International, and a church that knew how to love gay men and gay women and help them walk away from homosexuality. So I invested in that. And like, like John said, and as Dr. Dobson said, it wasn't an easy process. It was a very long, ugly, hard process. But you know, the Lord gives you the strength to be faithful when you need it. And I found that strength in who he was. And I continued to walk that process out. And as John said, I too uh, long to be married and long to have children and through this process about four years into it I began to realize that there was an individual that I had met her name was Angie that I began to feel quite differently when I was around her and and John said and alluded to that very thing you know puberty is hard enough once but to walk through it twice is a very difficult thing and Angie and I began to feel very different around her and I realized that I had fallen in love with this girl so 1994 December 4th at 4 o'clock, I married Angie. It was an incredible experience. Here was the Lord restoring the years that the locusts had stolen. And the story gets better, and I have one last thing that I want to share with you. After years of attempting to have children, my wife and I didn't think it was possible. She herself is post-abortive, so you can imagine what was running through our minds. She would say, well, I've killed two children. Why would the Lord allow me to serve and to bring up another life? And I would say, I was gay for 12 years. Um, I've gone against the very creative order that he designed. Why would he ever bless me? He wants to continue to punish me. But people in the church wrapped their arms around us and said, that isn't how God works. If he's put that desire in your heart, he will somehow fulfill it, whether it be through adoption or whether it be through granting that life to you. So we moved here to focus on the family after I had, uh, believe it or not, taken a job as a youth pastor. Can you imagine a man with my story? I have to tell you that through that process of desiring to be restored and be a youth pastor, which is a, a lifelong dream of mine, uh, it wasn't an easy process. I had to give my testimony to the parents, I had to give my testimony to the students, I had to give my testimony to the deacons, I had to give my testimony to the elders, I had to give my testimony to the pianist. I mean, I gave my testimony <laughs> to anybody in that church that would listen. But as I said, it was a church that believed in the life-changing power of Christ and said, who are we to say that you're not the man for the job? So they gave me a position as a youth pastor, uh, focus on the family, and John Polk um, invited me to come and be on staff. 
And uh, when my wife and I had moved here to Colorado Springs, we'd been married for five years. We were attempting to have children, and it just wasn't happening. So one night, my wife woke me up after we had moved into our new home, and she said, Honey, I have a verse that I want to read to you, and it was a verse in Psalm 127 that talks about how children are a heritage from the Lord. And uh, it talks about, Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. And I didn't say it, thank the Lord, but I thought, Honey, why did you wake me up to read me this verse? Because I don't even have a quiver. She handed me a gift, and I remember opening the package and pulling out this leather thing, and, and I said, I'm not sure what this is, and she said, honey, it's a quiver, and here's your first arrow because we're pregnant. Oh. So December 15th, So December 15, 1999, at 9.39 in the morning, but who's counting? My son, <laughs> Bennett Michael, was born. And Bennett means little blessed one, and it's also the last name of my brother-in-law and sister that took me in when I left homosexuality. And the story even gets better because just the other day I was handed another arrow by my two-year-old son and told that in May 9th I'll be a father again. So this is not a story about an ex-gay man or a post-abortive woman. But I'm hoping that you hear the message of hope that is given by our Heavenly Father that will go out of His way to love those that many within the church believe to be beyond God's reach. Thank you very much. I have heard those stories before in those accounts, and I know these men, uh, but it touches me every time because it offers hope to so many. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you have to pardon me, within Christendom we have had a tendency uh, to be angry at homosexuals, and it is true that the agenda that they want to impose on the culture and on Christianity is wrong, and we have to oppose that. But in every one of those cases, there's a hurting individual, gay or lesbian. There's a hurting individual who has a story to tell like this. Unfortunately, most of those uh, were not um, uh, accompanied by the kind of loving witness that these two men uh, heard. Thank you, gentlemen. And would you all... You see the pain. You've seen it. You've felt it in your own lives. But uh, you're now going all over the country and you're speaking at Love One Out conferences. And the purpose is not to, uh, you know, propagandize or, or uh, attack the homosexual movement. It is to reach out to those who are hurting. What are you hearing, John? Uh, what are people saying to you out there? Well, we have a very difficult job. Because as Doctor alluded to earlier, our our country has been brainwashed very successfully to believe that this is an unchangeable condition. People are extremely skeptical, even those within the church. However, the few men and women, and there's probably less than 25 of them, that are willing to put their lives on the line and speak out. And we have ministered through Focus on the Family for almost four years in the Love Went Out ministry that we do around the country. And the, the largest audience are parents, people like you, who love their children desperately. But no family's perfect. And we all make mistakes. And these parents come up to us crying, hmm. put their arms around us and say, you represent the hope for my son or daughter. And that's why we need to support this kind of work. There are very few people that are willing to stand up. Dr. Dobson's one of the few evangelical leaders that will stick his neck out. And his head's always being chopped off by the media and even the church. We don't want to face this, but we must. Because even though for the past 20 years the percentage of homosexuality has hovered around 3%, I'm convinced, and those, those of us that study this, feel it's going to increase because as Dr. Dobson said, children are impressionable and the gay activists are going 
after mm -hmm. your children. Not too long ago, I was speaking in a church in Ohio of 2,000 people, and I was talking about what the governor in California did in signing this legislation into law. And as I announced it, there was this blank stare from the congregation, and I got upset. And I said, did you hear what I said? Children are being taught that this is normal. That should anger you. That should upset you. That should motivate you to do something. And unfortunately, the church today, oftentimes, sadly, is so apathetic. So hopefully this video, Dr. Dobson's book, and what we're doing is going to make a difference. 40% of the constituents that come to our conference, the Love One Out conference, are family members of those that are gay or lesbian. You can imagine the joy that John and I experience when the mother comes up to us, tears streaming down her face, and says, thank you for giving me permission to love my gay son. That breaks my heart because I think, where has she ever gotten the message that she doesn't have permission to love her gay son because that's what he's investing in? And so that just keeps us going. Uh, John and I have often talked about, even as I, I joked about earlier, that we'd love to be flipping burgers, but how can we stop this message? It's so vital. It's so important. It keeps us going. Um, my wife is, is very supportive of this and she speaks about her issues as well, where we can admit our faults, where we can admit our flaws, because that's truly when the healing is going to take place. And I feel bad, Dr. Dobson, actually for people that aren't able to express as John and I are uh, and have to keep those secrets. When we go to the conferences and speak, people say, I don't know why I came. I came because this was a focus on the family event. But afterwards, they'll come up to us and say, you know what, I've hidden an adulterous affair in my life for years, and you've given me hope to see that the church will embrace me and will love me if I confess this, and I'm hoping to find the same freedom that you have. You know, when the uh, Love One Out conference comes to a given uh, city, there's usually an organized opposition. The media gets upset, and there are pickets and so on. And some of those folks, uh, the homosexuals, come in and listen to you. What happens at well, I'll the I'll tell you about the last conference we had just three weeks ago in Atlanta, Georgia. What we wanted to do when we started this in 1998 was present education to give people something they couldn't find anywhere else. And that, that's, a, that's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. that we have something that you don't have and we want to give that to you. But as time went by, we found that as our conference day ended, there was something missing mm -hmm. and something left out. So we decided we would give people an opportunity. The last conference, we, we gave this and I spent some time explaining to people what had happened during the day. 75 people walked forward out of a crowd of 600. I went off the stage went back, talked to the speakers. An hour later when we were leaving, there were still people up front. And when we asked those that prayed for those individuals, we said, what were people coming forward for? It was for a variety of reasons. Heterosexual fornication. Um, Repenting of their hatred towards gay men and gay women. Right. People saying, no longer am I going to be silent. I'm going to talk about this. Tremendous blessing. I'll never forget another conference. A lesbian couple walked forward and mm. said, we want to give our lives to Christ, we want to change, we want to overcome lesbianism. So it is such an honor to do something of this magnitude, even in a world that doesn't believe it. And as I told Dr. Dobson the other day, sometimes the only thing that keeps our staff going is knowing he's standing behind us. Amen. And when you have a father figure, who's willing to stand behind you and support you, you can do things that are very difficult. John, I think we must tell our friends about your failure a year or two ago yeah. uh, and, uh, and how it happened. You never have gone back into the homosexual life. You've never had sex outside of marriage. But there was something inside. Explain what happened very, very quickly. Yeah, a little over a year ago, I had, my, my work here at Focus had become so stressful. As you can imagine, we're in the forefront of the media. We, when you've been on the cover of Newsweek magazine, you walk in the grocery store, and there you are, and your parents see it, and your friends from high school see it, and the headline is Gay for Life, and you feel like hiding under a rock, and you're being attacked. Well, I had come to the place in my ministry where I felt like I could not be vulnerable anymore. Because we're so disbelieved, I felt like I had to have my act totally together, that I couldn't struggle with homosexuality, that I couldn't be tempted, so I pushed those temptations and struggles 
underground and I didn't talk about him anymore. Mm -hmm. And when I was in Washington, D.C. on a trip for focus, my temptation and my curiosity got the best of me, and that rebellious spirit crawled up in me, and I went into a homosexual bar. And I thought, I have not even been tempted to do this for 15 years, why am I here? And as I sat on this bar stool, I started talking to another man who I noticed had a wedding ring on. And I said, why are you here? You're married. He goes, well, you're married too. Well, someone spotted me in there and, of course, blasted it all over the media. And what happened was God took me through a very healing journey of cleansing and repentance and forgiveness and discipline. And brokenness. And brokenness. And really, I have to say at this point, having what, you never realize how much your wife loves you until you go through something so difficult. And to see Christians not sugarcoat things, but to say in the midst of this, we need to get you counseling, we will give you support, you will be accountable. I am, I am a better man today than I ever was before. And I think it's good because people have to see us that we are vulnerable, all of us as Christians, but then we can go on after making a mistake. Thank you, gentlemen. And would you all get me? Well, at the end of our time, last time, uh, we were beginning to talk about the origins of homosexuality, especially in uh, early child development. And uh, when that subject comes up, one name stands before me as the foremost authority on this topic, and his name is Dr. Joseph Nicolosi. Dr. Nicolosi is a, is a psychologist in private practice. He's a clinical uh, psychologist, and he has uh, just written a book uh, called Preventing Homosexuality that gets into those developmental factors, and I think you will find this very, very enlightening in understanding uh, where this developmental problem originates and how we can deal with it. And so let me welcome now, and would you help me welcome, Dr. Joseph Nicolosi. Now last time we were hearing from uh, John Pauk and Mike Haley about their own experience as, uh, as former homosexuals and the struggles they had as children. Uh, describe um, for our audience here and for those who are watching on video what was going on there. How did they get in difficulty and, and why did they take that turn uh, and why have so many millions of others taken the same path? Well, it's interesting because John and um, Mike offered two kinds of father patterns that are negative. One was an absent father who just did not get involved, and one was a critical father. And those are the two combinations we talk about, emotionally distant or critical father. And that's the two combinations that we try to avoid rather than an affirming father. Mm. Uh, of the mother and the father, both of them are important in terms of the formation of the boy's identity. But we put the emphasis on the father because the boy has to make that bonding with the father. You have written in your book, and again, it's not yet published, but I hope when it is, that every parent of boys and girls will read your book. It is that significant, and you've allowed me to quote uh, quite a bit of it in uh, my book, Bringing Up Boys. But you have talked about uh, homosexuality as a developmental problem, mm -hmm. uh, that it occurs from the relationship between the mother and the father, mm -hmm. typically. Mm -hmm. Now, there's child abuse and there's mm -hmm. all kinds of other things that are going on. But describe that primary relationship difficulty that leads in this direction. Well, basically, uh, both boys and girls are first identified with the mother. The mother is the primary love object for the boy and the girl. But the boy has the additional developmental task of disidentifying with the mother and connecting with the father. And that's extra work for him to do, which the girl doesn't have to do. The girl maintains her primary relationship with the mother, and that's where she gets her femininity from. Um, and so when the boy has to disconnect uh, with the mother and connect with the father, you need both the cooperation of the mother and the father. The mother has to be willing to let him go, and the father has to welcome him. And when you have 
a imbalance in one of those two, you can have problems. This is called the, um, the gender identity phase. We're talking about really one and a half to three years old. It's a very critical time when the boy discovers that the world is divided between male and female and which one will he be. Yeah. You, in fact, talked in your book uh, about the fact that boys are not born knowing how to be male. Exactly. You have to learn that. It's an, it's a, um, uh, Robert Stoller said, masculinity is an accomplishment. It's an achievement. And this might explain why we have more male homosexuality than lesbianism. Some people say two to one, five to one, seven to one, because it's easier to be female than it is to be male. If you do nothing, the male will not become masculine. Something has to happen. We, you know, so-called primitive societies, we, we have rights of initiation, male initiation rights, but we don't have that. We, we're losing sight of that. Everything is, is um, co-ed activities. So the boy needs special help in making that masculine adjustment. Well, let me put that into my words and then you comment on it. Um, at the moment of birth, of course, the mother is extremely important to the boy and continues that way until about 18 months of age. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, most mothers can attest to the fact that they can feel and see the boy begin to pull back from her just a little bit. And in a normal uh, developmental process, uh, he gradually um, detaches from her and then differentiates his um, self-concept, his gender identity, by linking himself to his father. Occurring very, very early. Very, 18 very months. early. 18 months. All right. And from there to five years of age, mm -hmm. that role modeling occurs. The mm -hmm. father is desperately needed at that time to affirm that boy to care for him, to teach him what it means to be a man. Many men, many boys of all ages have no clue what it means to be masculine because they've never seen it modeled. Exactly. It's certainly not on television. They have not seen it in the movies and many of them have not seen it at home. And the problem is that we also have to avoid cliches and stereotypes of what masculinity and femininity is. The example of the boy cooking and he'd rather cook than go fishing, as someone was saying that in the camping situation. That's okay. We don't have to make the boy feel bad about that. As long as you have an emotional connection with the boy. If the boy feels good about the father, we talk about father salience. Salience has two characteristics, benevolence and strength. The boy has to see the father as good and strong. And if the boy sees the father as good and strong, he will normally and naturally want to do what the father does. And that's how he takes on the masculinity. It's not the stereotypic behaviors, but a more of a sense of, of who he is, basically. Hmm. I saw it in uh, our own home, and I think I've, I've mentioned this uh, already in one of the videos, that when our son was five years of age, we would go out uh, to get in the car. We were going, the whole family was going to uh, go to eat. And there are four of us, a boy and a girl, and Shirley and me. And Ryan would very typically say, hey, Dad. I'd say what? He'd say, uh, us guys will sit in the front seat. Uh, the girls will sit in the back seat. Now, he wasn't lording this over his sister and his mother. He was saying, I'm like you. I'm a guy like you. Us guys are going to sit in the front seat. I have and, and that was a healthy thing. You know, he was identifying with me. He's mm -hmm. saying, I want to be a man like you. Mm -hmm. A little twist on that, my interpretation is the first time I've heard of this. I think he was loading it over it. The boy has to feel... <laughs> well, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> Part of being a boy is feeling that being a boy is special. You're lucky to be a boy. And I know that sounds chauvinistic, and we'll, we'll teach him later about reality, but right now, at that, <laughs> at that point, he really needs to feel that it's special. You know what? Uh, I affirm that. We, uh, <laughs> uh, I went to a hunting trip in South Dakota recently, and there are about 20 people there. And I've done this for seven or eight years. I go every year with about 20 guys. And this year was the first year that the women have been invited and a few sisters and uh, and some of the the boys that are that are invited are pretty young one of them was 11 years of age and he deeply resented that exactly. he resented the yeah. fact that the women were invited now it really it was made for a very fun trip you know they some of the women hunted and some of them stayed in the lodge but it was neat having them there so i didn't object to that but he did and i understood it 
and he felt like, man, this is a guy thing. This is something us guys do together. And he, he resented the fact that his that. sister and his mother were invited to, uh, to come along. And this is why this, this co-ed activity is really not such a healthy thing, I think. Boys need to be separate to affirm their masculinity. They need to be away from girls, have that distance, so that they can be so solid in their masculinity that then they can return to women, but return to them as men. So it's like a pendulum. You leave the mother, you deepen your sense of masculinity, and then with that, you can return to women and, and be in relationship with them. All right. Now, the question that begs to be asked is with regard to prevention. You've written a book called Preventing Homosexuality. Uh, the question is how. Uh, what do you do when a family comes to you and they've got an effeminate boy, he wants to wear girls' clothing, uh, he is beginning to sound and talk mm -hmm. and look like a girl. What do you do when the family comes to you? First of all, basically what I really wind up doing is telling parents to do what in their gut they want to do. They know there's something wrong with it. They want to take action, but they're intimidated. They're getting mixed messages. They're getting confused messages from the media, from teachers, from other counselors. They said, don't do anything. Your son is gay. Uh, if you try to change him, he'll be traumatized, et cetera, et cetera. We give the opposite advice. Father, get more involved. Mother, back off. And consistently tell your son he's a boy. And when the boy does something effeminate, you say, you don't want to do that. That's what girls do, and you're a boy, and being a boy is special. So you're not shaming him. No, you, you no. avoid the shaming. Yeah. yeah. But you are teaching him that it's, there is that something. Being a boy is special, and mommy and daddy love you and are happy when you're a boy. And what we can accomplish in three or four months with the cooperation of mother and father takes years to be done with adult homosexuals. Now, that's a problem for both mothers and fathers. For mothers, they feel rejected when they see they their sons pull back. They do. And for fathers, a particular boy might not be a good fit with that father. Mm -hmm. A particular boy may have a sensitive spirit, may not be able to throw a football, may not sound like a boy. And the tendency of that father is, is to pull back himself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if that right. happens, then the boy is going to gravitate Absolutely. to the safe place. Absolutely. The father has to go against his inclination to be turned off by the boy's effeminacy. And, you know, we talk about how the mothers are resistant to give up their sons, but I can tell you, I'm glad I have an opportunity to do it on video, the, the fathers are the most resistant. Mothers, if you give them a program, they'll do it. But the, but the fathers are most resistant. They just don't do what they need to do. Why, Joseph? At their personality, or they, uh, it strikes something inside of themselves, some, some insecurities or in inferiorities or doubts about their own masculinity. But even though these fathers are shocked when I tell them that there's a statistically a 75% correlation between boyhood effeminacy and adult homosexuality or bisexuality or transvestitism, and so they're shocked to hear the statistic, but they just don't do it. And I have to continuously coach these fathers to get involved with their sons and make that emotional connection. I hope you all heard what he just said, because you won't read that anywhere else. Where you have a very effeminate boy who is beginning to show signs of this uh, gender identity crisis. Uh, you call it pre-homosexuality. It's a pre-homosexual condition. There is a 75% chance that that boy will go on to develop full-blown homosexuality. Absolutely. Especially if he goes to school and he hears... Oh, then it'll be affirmed. Yeah. And you have a window there that you can deal with it. Absolutely. Can it be prevented? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you have the cooperation of mother and father, if they work together as a parental team, you can turn these boys around in about three or four months. In my book, Bringing Up Boys, uh, in the chapter called The Origins of Homosexuality, which leans very heavily on Dr. Nicolosi, uh, I quoted a letter that was sent to me a while back uh, from a boy, and this is what he wrote to me, and I would like to read it. He's 13 years old, and I would like you to comment on what's going on here. If you have no compassion for homosexuals, listen to this letter and tell me how you would feel if this was your son. Dear Dr. Dobson, I've been putting this off for a long time, so I'm finally writing you a letter. 
I'm a 13-year-old boy. I've listened to your tapes preparing for adolescence, but not the complete set. I did listen to the one on sex, though. Getting to the point, I don't know if I have a serious problem or one that's passing. All through my life, which is very short, I have acted and I look much more like a girl than a boy. When I was little, I would always wear fingernail polish and dresses and the sort. I also had an older cousin who would take us as little cousins into his room and show us his genitals. I'm afraid I have a little sodomy in me. It was very hard for me to write what I just did. I don't want to be a homosexual, but I'm afraid, very afraid. That was hard to write too. Let me explain further. Through my higher grades in school, I'm in the seventh grade, kids have always called me names, gay, fag, and so on. That seems to go along with it, doesn't it? And made fun of me. It's been hard. I have masturbated, I guess, and gone too far. He then describes some behavior that I won't uh, subject you to. That sounds very bad and looks even worse to read it. I pray that nothing is wrong with me. Very recently, I've done such acts as looking, maybe lusting, at myself in skimpy underwear. Whenever I wear it, I feel like sexual sensation. Yesterday in the bathroom in front of the mirror, I wiggled my body very rapidly, making my genitals bounce up and down. I get a little bit of that feeling mentioned above as I write this. After I did this, I immediately asked God to forgive me. I went into the shower, but did it again there. I prayed more, and I felt very bad. Listen to the conflict that's going on in this boy, and especially with regard to guilt and his relationship with God. I talked with one of my pastors and I told him at that point that I probably preferred a man's body over a woman. Now that was hard to say. He said he didn't think anything was wrong with me. I don't know how else to say it. He apparently thought it was passing. But I felt very badly and I want to know why. The pastor mentioned above is one that I go to for advice very often. I have been baptized and I'm well liked in church I think. I'm afraid that if I'm not straight, that's much easier to write, I will go to hell. I don't want to be not straight. I don't try to be not straight. I love God and I want to go to heaven. If something is wrong with me, I want to get rid of it. Please help me. Mark, <laughs> what, what agony at 13 agony. years of day. So painful. Now, his pastor told him that it's just passing. Of course. That's because he didn't know what advice. else to say. Yeah. And he didn't know what else to say because we're not training pastors and we're not training counselors what to say. They just don't know what to say. What would you have said to him if he'd come to you? Well, first of all, you hear the pain. I tell clients when they come in, your problem is not your homosexuality. Homosexuality is not about sex. Homosexuality is about a deep sense of pain, a deep sense of alienation. This is a very lonely, suffering kid where are his parents? That's the first thing that came to my mind when he was putting the nail polish on. So it's a, there's an emotional pain. And sex is used to cover up the pain, the pain of alienation, the pain of feeling different, the pain of feeling weak. And I really, when I do this work, we get the shift away from homosexuality and focus on the pain. And the pain is not belonging, not feeling connected. That's why it's not a sexual problem, it's a gender problem, it's an identity problem. Well, if his parents had read the literature that's out there today or had well, watched right. television, mm -hmm. they would have believed, first of all, that mm -hmm. this was a genetic difficulty, mm -hmm. and secondly, that if they didn't encourage it, that they would warp him forever. Well, well we're seeing the benefits of, of this um, sort of parenting. I mean, mm -hmm. the kid is still unhappy. Could you have helped that 13-year-old? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And to, to show him, first of all, again, that it's about that sense of pain and alienation that's your real problem. We talked uh, earlier about pre-homosexuality. Uh, in your book, which I've quoted here, you said there are five characteristics that parents need to look for mm -hmm. in that condition. Mm -hmm. And then if they see those characteristics, they really need to address them and get help from somebody who understands what you have talked about.
Number one, repeatedly stated desire to be or insistence that he or she is the other sex. Two, in boys, preference for cross-dressing or simulating female attire, and in girls, insisting on wearing only stereotypical masculine clothing. Number three, strong and persistent preference for cross-sexual roles in make-believe play or persistent fantasies of being the other sex. Number four, intense desire to participate in stereotypical games and pastimes of the other sex. And number five, a strong preference for playmates of the other sex. When you see those five, there's a problem developing. Big problem. In fact, you can have a problem without that graphic, even let more subtle, you can have a problem. I put out the very uh, graphic um, signs for parents to, to pay attention to. And when you see those five, there is a 75% chance. If you do nothing, that he if will... you do nothing, he will go on to become homosexual. That's why we call it a pre-homosexual child. Mm. Yeah. What else do you want to tell us with the remaining moments? Say uh, anything you want to suggest to parents uh, and grandparents who are here. This is something not known. It's I not understood. I, I mean, you. this is new information in the culture. It's not out there and yet you have a lifetime of experience exactly. to document it. Yeah. Well, another thing I would just say is if there's any doubts that homosexuality, the gay lifestyle is normal and natural, I can tell you we've done the research, our organization has done the research, there is much more pathology, much more self-defeating, self-destructive, maladaptive behaviors in people who label themselves gay compared to heterosexuals in terms of sexual activities, drug, uh, drug abuse, alcohol abuse. I, we can go on and on and on. We did a big study, and it really has a lot of unhappiness associated with it. Joseph, in your work as a clinical psychologist, it must be very, very gratifying to uh, deal with somebody like John or Mike or the others who have been heavily into the homosexual lifestyle to come up and out of that mm -hmm. and to be whole again. Mm -hmm and especially to introduce them to Jesus Christ. And especially to be told by the American Psychiatric Association that you can't do this. Yeah. <laughs> and we're doing it. That's right. They have actually tried exactly. to pass uh, yes, regulations. Exactly. Well, what I do every day, and therapists like me do, is against the American Psychiatric Association. And the American Psychological Association. the American Association. Psychological Association is also. Yeah, under heavy, heavy lobbying exactly. from the homosexual community. Yes. So science gives way now. Uh, to you know, follow. Any questions from the audience, okay? What advice would you give to a single mom who has a sensitive boy and um, the father is either absent or, in worst case scenario, gay himself? Mm. Um, again, you have more work to do because you don't have a father around. So um, you have to affirm his masculinity. You have to make him feel good as a boy, not only as your child in the neutered sense, but as your, your son, as your boy. Also, I would try to find some father figure, um, maybe um, an older brother, your father, uh, a father figure who can get more involved with this boy if the father is not being involved. I uh, uh, did 20 interviews in a row the other day on this book. Uh, they were about four minutes in length and one minute between. These were televised interviews. And so they were all over the country. They were live interviews that were part of the news program around the country. And that question that you've asked was asked by almost every one of them because it's the obvious thing that's happening out there. There's so many single mothers. Uh, you know, the, the number of households headed by single mothers increased 25% just between 1990 and, and 2000. And that question comes up. How are we going to raise healthy boys? And you can find role models for them, but you have to work hard to find them. And you can't do it. Mm -hmm. I, I hate to say it. You're not equipped to show a boy what it means to be a man because you've never been there. Now most women were little girls when they were young and so you can't do that. So this is why I support the Boy Scouts 
as I do. That is a wonderful organization, and it's also why they're under attack, because it is for political reasons. Boy Scouts, boys clubs, uh, church youth groups, youth pastors who are male and uh, who are confident in who they are and who will affirm your boys, school teachers, coaches, organized sports. Uh, there are so many places that you can get it, but you absolutely have to get it. An uncle, as you said, or, or a neighbor, or someone who can show your boy what it means to be male. You've got to find that, don't you? And also not to trash your husband or your ex-husband. A lot of women feel very hurt that they're not getting child support, and they will complain to the boy about this father. The, the boy has a need to see the father positively, so you have to try to with, withhold that temptation to, to criticize the father in front of the boy. Okay, another question. When I graduated in 1973 at the State University of California, uh, we had an expert give a class. Uh, we took a class on sexuality. My wife, uh, Carla, was able to come to that class. Uh, we had a specialist on homosexuality, and what he spoke to is exactly what you have said, the truth, okay, what you just said. What I'd like to know is what's happened since that time. Has it been politically that, that's changed this? I mean, exactly. obviously in 1973, if they known what you know, we've gone a long way here. Yeah, exactly. You said 1973. It's a very interesting that you said 1973. That was the year that the American Psychiatric Association changed the diagnosis and said that homosexuality was now normal. And that was a total political decision. I mean, they basically, in one day, in one vote, swept away uh, like at least 100 years of literature. And uh, this is a political position. So since 1973 forward, there's been a very intimidating effect. You can't do research. You can't get your uh, research published. We've tried to get some things published. We, we get a great deal of resistance. Uh, it's not being taught in the graduate schools. I did not learn anything from the graduate school that I, that I graduated from. I learned from my clients, from what my clients were telling me. I began to put the pieces together and then went back into the early literature and found that there was a whole wealth of literature on the, on the cause and treatment of homosexuality that nobody talks about. It's very interesting, too, that the man who was most responsible for that decision in 1973 by the American Psychiatric Association, Dr. Spitzer, That's right. uh, has now recanted. He's come around. And he has had the courage to say I was wrong. But he was vilified for doing that within the profession. The one person who's responsible for that decision is Dr. Robert Spitzer. And recently, in a couple of months ago, he said, if my son was gay, I would hope that he would go to therapy for change. Now, of course, he angered his, <laughs> his supporters, his gay supporters, but he's been coming around. And he also said that he felt that as someone who was instrumental in changing the 73 decision to normalize homosexuality, he feels that he was somewhat responsible for the spread of AIDS. Mm. Interesting. And he is Jewish. Jewish. And he is very religious, liberal. Very liberal. And he would not agree with us on anything. And he was able to find 200 people who had successfully come out of homosexuality and had made a heterosexual adjustment. There's the hope, folks. They can beat it if they get the proper treatment, but it's hard. It's hard. I, it's I think it was therapy. really wrong to imply that it's this is therapy. duck soup because it's not. It's very, very difficult. And that's why I'm so proud of the, the two gentlemen on our staff, uh, John Polk and Mike Haley, because they've invested the hard work necessary mm -hmm. uh, to, to accomplish this. You know, the pain is so deep when you see your friends who have homosexual children buy the lie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They will, they will uh, accept what their gay child tells them that, well, it's impossible to change. Exactly. So you just got to accept me the way I am. Exactly. So they say, okay, I love you, son, but uh, will not accept the fact that change can occur. Exactly. How, what kind of intervention, what is possible to break the cycle of that uh, buying the lies? Um, you could tell them that change is possible, that you've heard about it, you've, you've, you've heard people speak, you've read books, you've, you've attended seminars, you know that people can change. And if they're honest with you, they'll tell you, I never felt connected to my father, I never felt my father really loved me, I was too enmeshed with my mother, I found that I had to be involved with my mother to meet her emotional needs. Uh, 
I always felt different, even before I had homosexual feelings. There are certain things that are in place even before homosexuality becomes an issue. And if they're honest, they'll start to see that there were these preceding causal factors and that homosexuality is only a final outcome. But, but you're, you're fighting a culture. I mean, <laughs> what you can do in five minutes, they, they're watching the media and tell, and internet is also very, very dangerous. Gay chat lines, and it, it just goes on and on. And all the pornography, pornography. that's there, which is doing incredible damage. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I came from a very promiscuous background, heterosexually, and when I accepted Christ and got married, yeah, I still had some temptation, but certainly not or something I could not overcome. And yet I hear continuously how difficult it is for a homosexual to move out of that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I guess I'm troubled and I'm confused as to why once they've gone to the therapy and once they recognize the cause of it, mm -hmm. why is it so difficult to come out of it whereas from a heterosexual promiscuity, it doesn't seem to be that difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. Good question. Very good question. Two reasons. First of all, you're not fighting the culture like these individuals are fighting. You're not seeing heterosexually promiscuous characters be on, on television, on the media, being glorified. That's number one. So, and, and you're not being told across the board that you can't change. This is who you are. So that's the first thing. You're not fighting a culture. Second thing is, again, we go back to the original hurt. This is not about sexuality. This is about identity, core gender identity, which they continually try to relieve the pain of through, through uh, homosexual behavior. So it's a really a deeper core. You know, what's interesting to me, uh, Joseph, is that um, the intensity of homosexuality compared to heterosexuality mm -hmm. uh, is almost off the chart. It is off the chart. Uh, you know, and, and that's an interesting question too because what heterosexual do you know whose politics is determined by their sexual activity, whose uh, reading material, whose vacations and trips, whose work assignment and whose passion in everything they do is governed by their sexuality. Exactly. Where does that intensity come from? Because that goes to the question we were just it asked. It goes to a desperate attempt to solidify and reinforce a lie. That's basically it. They have bought a lie that cannot be substantiated biologically in nature in any other way and they are continually promoting, it's like a cult. In many ways you can make the argument that the gay community is a cult in the sense that it's a false idea that is constantly being reinforced. Um, Anne Heche, who left uh, Ellen DeGeneres, she came to realize that she was not lesbian and she has been tortured by the media because she's no longer the idealized model of the lesbian. And um, so there's a constant need to really punish the person who wants to leave. And linked with it all is the pain of early childhood and that sexual identity crisis. Well, thank you all for participating with us uh, today and, and on the previous uh, video. Uh, Dr. Nicolosi, you're a national treasure and I appreciate what you stand for. I pray that a large secular publishing house will publish your book uh, there's a lot of resistance to it, and the big houses are leery because they'll be vilified if they do that. I'm uh, thinking that you're a national treasure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everyone.